Sports on Boulevard Time. Welcome, everyone, to the Boulevard's Collector Series. My name is Michael Benevente. I'm the managing director of the Boulevard Brands, based here on the 29th floor of the Empire State Building. Today is a special day. This next episode is with Carl Rosen. Carl Rosen is currently our brand historian for the last five years. But prior to that, Carl worked for the company for over 30 years in many various roles. And so today, we're going to have the pleasure of speaking to Carl about some of his uh, observations and achievements over those last 30 years at the Boulevard Watch Company. Welcome, Carl Rosen. Thank you, Michael. It's uh, great to be here. Yeah, you look great. I love that book behind you, uh, Our Boulevard History of First, which actually uh, you were very much involved in helping um, the company and the brand uh, piece together uh, those great achievements. I uh, love to see that book. Uh, and it's always, it's always by my side as well, as I refer to it many times. Uh, and it's a big help to someone who has to uh, help steward the brand, um, especially through these uh, crazy times. Yeah. So let's jump into uh, talking a little bit, Carl, about your 30 years at Boulevard and how, in your opinion, has that helped um, you become the Boulevard brand historian? What, what, what have you drawn off of those many years? Yeah, um, it was many years ago. Actually, my first date was, uh, day of work was February 29th. So that was maybe an omen that uh, something special was going to happen. <laughs> um, and I've had the honor of uh, working for the company for a long time and it's given me an opportunity to work in a lot of different areas over those times. So it was very challenging, uh, always kept me uh, engaged. Um, over those years, I was responsible for either worked in um, or was responsible for or analyzed really most of the areas within the Boulevard Corporation, whether or not it was inventory control or customer service. Um, I really touched all parts of the organization. And um, when I retired as chief operating officer, I had responsibilities for customer service and repair and purchasing and quality control. Um, over the years, I was responsible for the national sales force. In 2001 or so, I became president of Bull of a Swiss SA. So I handled all the international distribution, which was uh, a challenge, but a lot of fun. I got to deal with um, our operations domestically and overseas, with our distributors, with our customers, with the retailers. So it really positioned me to have a touch point with all parts of the organization, which has been great now as the historian. Um, I can refer to those pieces, but the biggest thing is I got to touch a lot of people and see what the passion was for the brand by everybody that was involved in all aspects of it. I really, you know, having been here five and a half years now myself, I, I see that energy, you know, especially with all of the retired Boulevard people or former Boulevard employees. I love how many of you still communicate, still talk to each other. It was a real family atmosphere. Yes. Um, for many once companies. you once you have Boulevard in your blood, it's always there. So you're always part of the Boulevard family, even if you've retired. Yeah, that, that's I think one of the most special things of the brand that people don't you know really realize. So today I'm sitting here, uh, as I mentioned in the opening, at the Empire State Building, our current home for the last six years, um, on the 29th floor, and I'm actually sitting in in a room that you had a lot to do with. Um, the museum. Um, so we have our archives and museum here that um, basically we, we had to try to piece together uh, again uh, six years ago. You were instrumental along with, uh, with Julie. And so perhaps you can tell us a little bit about that work um, yeah. and how you went about starting that. Yeah, well, first, it was an honor for me to be asked to sort of come back. I had been gone for about six years or so uh, to start this. But, you know, the first thing we had to do was define what the archive was going to be, why we wanted to have it. So what we decided was that the archive was to honor the past, to celebrate the present, but as importantly, to inspire the future. So we collected things and uh, not only things, but stories, which um, to me, the biggest surprise is how much we've been able to inspire new product development. And, um, uh, you know, it, it's been a, a great journey. The, the museum that you have behind you is only really the tip of the iceberg of what we have in the archives. We have over 2000 physical items and we have about 5,000 digital items. So besides the physical um, museum you see, part of it is, is digitized and these are even available on boulevard.com, the sort of a museum history section that uh, customers around the world, if they wanna find out about the legacy and the stories of Boulevard, uh, they can um, interact with it uh, digitally. 
What was your biggest surprise, would you say, in as we were curating the museum? What what item uh, is there? Is there an item? Is there a watch? And we have other things other than watches, which people may not yeah. realize as well. Yeah, um, actually, one, one story. It's not maybe the most surprising uh, um, part of the history, but I see right behind you reminds me. Um, we have a bull of a sword. Uh, hanging. So people always say, what is that? Um, and Bulova was extremely creative in marketing besides product development. And in 1970, they came out with a watch called the Golden Clipper. And in the ad, which is also behind you uh, next to the sword, the ad was a watch so magnificent, it deserves to be knighted. So what Bulova did was contract with the Queen Swordsmith, Wilkinson Sword in the UK to have 100 swords made that say Bull of a Golden Clipper on the blade. So uh, a little vignette in the museum, which is maybe representative of the types of stories we have is we have an original Golden Clipper watch in the original packaging, never been used, never been worn, a copy of the original ad and one of those 100 swords that were given um, randomly by lottery to 100 consumers that bought the watch. So it's really a whole story. But you know, to talk about what we discovered or what was the sort of revolutionary, the thing I think I'm most proud of is that Bulova had the first television commercial. And this is, you know, when you talk about a consumer product or a watch company, you talk about this watch or that watch. But I think that one of the accomplishments was in 1941, before the Philadelphia Phillies Brooklyn Dodgers game, Bulova had the first television commercial ever, and it was America Runs on Bulova Time. America Runs on Bulova Time. And in doing the research, we found that it cost the company a total of $9 to not only produce the ad, but to run the ad. So I think that that was a real momentous occasion uh, in America, in technology, and in, for any brand. Carl, since you led us down this rabbit hole of firsts, yeah. Um, why don't we talk a little bit about, I, I mean, the book that I referenced behind you is called The History of First. And I think, I, I mean, myself, I, I've been in the watch business uh, over 25 years, and I never knew that until I came to the company that Bulova had the first television commercial ever. Um, why don't you tell our, our viewers what other firsts they may not be aware of, as, such as the radio commercial and, and yeah, yeah. some of those other really fun, you know, fun firsts, let's call it. Yeah. So um, the, as I said, the TV commercial was 1941 and Bulova was the first to run a national uh, radio commercial. That was in 1926. And at the time, radio was the way that people got the news. They got their entertainment. And um, Bulova was the first to do nationally um, ads or what they call uh, time checks. It would be like it's 8 p.m. B-U-L-O-V-A Bulova watch time. And across America, hundreds and hundreds of radio stations would run these time checks. So everyone heard Bulova multiple times a day. Um, and I think that having been the first national radio commercial, it made more pressure to put it on television as being the first so that they really wanted to you know, continue that legacy. Um, uh, over the years, I was in charge of the clock division. So I'm also very proud that Bulova created the first clock radio. And that was 1928. And, um, you know, you think of clock radios as these small little items. Uh, we have one in the museum, but the original clock radio was more like a, a, a grandfather or a grandmother clock with a radio embedded in it. Um, an, another, uh, another area to, to think about is as you were, as you were with the company um, for all of those years, and I'm sure, you know, the company was always working on different projects. What didn't get completed that you would have liked to have seen, you know, completed? Like, you know, sometimes things run out of energy or you go in different directions. Yeah. Actually, funny you mentioned that uh, uh, made me think uh, run out of energy. Uh, one of the projects, uh, which is in the early 1980s, was something called the Thermotron. Mm, yeah. And this is a watch. Uh, it was thermodynamics uh, through electronics, just the way Accutron is accuracy through electronics. And so... Um, the thermotron was to be powered by changes in temperature of, of different materials. And uh, the watch itself that was designed, the, the style was really very unique and um, it was going to be another first for Bulova. Uh, but in the end, it was decided it didn't meet the quality standards and the expectations that Bulova had in the consumer community, but also the, um, the standards that Bulova had set for you know, accuracy and reliability. So that project had to be abandoned. There's another project that in the archives we've abandoned, uh, or not abandoned, but we've at least delayed, is um, to 
recreate some of the old iconic pieces. And in the 1930s, 20s and 30s, the Art Deco period, mm. uh, Boulevard was at its heyday. And I think that because uh, Joseph Boulevard started in jewelry, um, there was a lot of this embedded into the design of those watches. And the, we have a collector um, who's a European who now lives in Hong Kong, who decided to collect Boulevard Art Deco watches. His collection is over 600 pieces and Incredible. he's in the process of finalizing a book about Boulevard Art Deco pieces. So I got an opportunity to take a look at them and, and what the history was. And I was sort of disappointed that we had decided to defer recreating that. Um, some of it is because of the craftsmanship that we required and maybe consumer taste today, but I hope sometime we'll be able to um, reissue some of those iconic pieces uh, to sort of preserve the legacy and tell the story again and again. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I, I love those watches. I mean, they're, they're really uh, uh, works of art, um, individually, uh, each one so special. I, I think uh, we may have caught a break with uh, The Queen's Gambit, uh, which yeah. was uh, on Netflix this past many months, uh, still, I think, rated in the top uh, 10 or 15 uh, uh, episodic series. On Netflix, but that's introduced a whole generation to, you know, these really beautiful, smaller ladies watches. Now, I know that that one is not Art Deco necessarily, but I'm hoping I'm also hopeful like you that um, we'll be able to maybe reintroduce a whole new generation to um, these beautiful works of art. They're really not time pieces yeah. only, but uh, works of art. Yeah. They're, re they're really a uh, piece of jewelry, too. Yes. Um, you know, that happened to tell time. Yeah. With that said, over... 145 years of history. And, and again, most people don't probably realize um, that the Boulevard Watch Corporation has been in existence for 145 years uninterrupted, which to me is always uh, a really cool part of, you know, working for the brand and, and how many brands can say that anyway. But tell us about Joseph Boulevard's impact on watchmaking, especially focusing on the 10s and 20s. Um, I, I think most watch enthusiasts or historians don't realize the importance of what Joseph Boulevard brought to wristwatch making. Yeah, well, uh, he came to this country um, and first worked for Tiffany for about five years before he started the company in 1875. And it wasn't until you know the, the teens that he started coming out with watches like in 1912 and, and, and beyond. But um, there are a couple of things that he did that really impacted watchmaking. One is the standardization of parts. What he wanted to do is make Boulevard um, aspirational, but also affordable. And so by having standardization of parts, it made the manufacturing a lot easier. It also made the repair of those watches a lot easier. So somebody could buy a watch and use it for many, 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 many years. Also for repair, one of the patents that he got in 1926, I think, was for the dust cover, um, which was a cover between the movement and the case back to really keep dust out of that movement. So you wanted to make sure that, you know, you had a, a watch that was going to operate and operate um, uh, efficiently. So there were some of these subtleties that he did um, as well as some of the sort of the big thing. Um, I think the impact on watchmaking was both for men and women. In um, like uh, 1919, he really came out with the first line of men's jeweled wrist watches. Um, in World War I especially, men started wearing wristwatches. It was much more convenient to look down at your wrist and tell the time than having to take out a pocket watch during, during battle. And it was sort of these military uses of a wristwatch that made it extremely popular and maybe even put a push to miniaturize the movement so they weren't as large as a pocket watch, so they could fit on your wrist and be extremely comfortable. In the 1920s, about 1924, he came out with the first line of ladies' wristwatches. And Bulova has never been really known for one particular style. It's always been a collection and uh, it was in tune with the fashions of the time and it let people choose what was relevant to them and what they wanted to wear. And often people would own multiple Bulovas so they wear different things at, at different times. So I think the introduction for the men's jeweled wristwatches and the ladies' wristwatches were extremely important in, in putting Boulevard watches onto people's wrists. Do you think he took inspiration from Henry Ford uh, in terms of his standardization? You think yeah, that, that was a, a lot of people. 
a lot of people do call him the Henry Ford of watchmaking. Um, and if you talk to watchmakers and collectors, they're very appreciative that uh, he took that because the number of parts, and I was responsible for the repair area, uh, that you have to keep if you want to maintain the watches. And people have a personal connection to their watches. They remember who gave it to them, for what occasion. They're very, very connected. Every time you put that watch on, you're, you're tied back to uh, the occasion of, of the person. So uh, Boulevard gets a lot of repairs that are post-warranty because people want to keep them running to keep that legacy and that connection going. So it was, it really all emanated from the standardization of those parts that uh, made a lot of this possible. And on the, on women's watches or ladies watches, um, certainly during that time period that you were just mentioning, uh, we recreated a collection from that started in 1917, the Rubiat uh, yeah. collection. On the back of the case back was this beautiful image of, I guess, what would be called the goddess of time. Yes. And, and how, how was he using that mark? How was he using that imagery? Was that something that he was using throughout? Well, I, I think it was sort of an homage to women. Um, in Greek mythology, I don't believe that there is a goddess of time, actually. There is a god of time, Kronos. So, you mm -hmm. know, a chronometer, a yep. chronograph comes from that. Uh, but it was to make sure that women had equal footing. And over the years, they've been very big on even women empowerment. Later on in the 1970s, they came out with a, an ad, equal pay, equal time, that Boulevard did watches for women as well as men. Actually, I uh, did some recent research uh, in, the, in the 20s, even through almost 1960, uh, the person who ran the Boulevard Swiss factory uh, was a woman. So it was very unusual at the time for companies to empower women that way and not only develop, but also be part of that culture in the company. I, I wanna to touch on that part that you just mentioned about Switzerland. I think that's also a big advantage that the Boulevard brand has held for so many years. Um, I don't think they were ever hung up on country of origin. I like to call it country of origin. Like, so if you're Swiss brand, you have to be Swiss, you know, made. And if you're maybe an Asia based uh, brand, you have to be, you know, maybe like our sister uh, brand citizen, you know, they're made in Japan, which of course is, is great as well. But, you know, Bova uh, literally being in the middle of these two big giant making watch, uh, watchmaking uh, places uh, took a different approach. Um, and I know you were involved in the Swiss uh, office and ran that that business, but let let our viewers know a little bit about um, how long ago Bulova was making Swiss watches. I think most most people would be shocked or surprised about how far back. Yeah, well, uh, the factory probably opened in the twenties. Um, it was um, like the philosophy, I guess, was the best of the best. I love if that. If you couldn't yes. get the best you had to create it and start your own factory, whether or not it was a case factory in Providence, if it was a movement factory in Switzerland, if it didn't exist and it had to exist for you to develop what you wanted to, you had to do it on your own. Um, over time, that best of best philosophy turned into, we could not compete or put enough resources in to um, develop the most sophisticated things. And rather than force our own factories to make something, we decided to go on a worldwide basis and, and pick different factories for the best movement manufacturer, the best case manufacturer, the one that could set the diamonds the best. So um, uh, it gave us a lot of flexibility. But um, you know, Switzerland was the um, hub of watchmaking. Um, a lot of the movements came from there and um, you know, it, it still continues. Um, what amazed me when I would go over to Switzerland is see factories that only manufactured hands or only hand, or only manufactured dials. So everybody was very um, uh, unique. And now today you have these sort of watch conglomerates that sort of have eaten up all of these uh, smaller companies. But, you know, Boulevard still sources um, and make sure that they can provide the quality and the kinds of designs for the consumers um, for today and tomorrow. Let's uh, let's switch up a little bit and let's let's talk a little bit. You know, Joseph Bullo was a visionary, uh, but many people may not be aware of his son, Artie, and his contributions to the success of the company. Joseph, as founder, certainly, you know, uh, putting a major uh, pillar, you know, into the company. But Artie really took it in a different direction. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about that? Yeah, I would say um, 
uh, Joseph was a uh, was an innovator, um, uh, a watchmaker, a jeweler, but um, Artie was a marketing genius. And a lot of the accomplishments with the company, I think, are because of of that focus. Uh, in 1927, Bulova offered, through uh, Artie's efforts, um, a prize for the person who could first fly nonstop from New York to Paris. In 1927, that was Charles Lindbergh. So at the time, Bulova uh, presented a $1,000 check to Charles Lindbergh, which was a lot of money at the time, mm -hmm. um, and also a commemorative watch uh, for that accomplishment. But they also came out within weeks with a watch called the Lone Eagle. And this commemorated uh, the event. Charles Lindbergh was known as a Lone Eagle because he flew solo, that was his nickname. And he became an ambassador to the company. And this was at a time when celebrities were really not ambassadors. Uh, so I thought that was very innovative from a, uh, from a marketing standpoint. And a few years later, when the Pulva came out with the watertight watch, which was uh, water resistant, built for with water resistant construction, which was unusual at the time, they called upon Johnny Weissmuller, who was not only an Olympic swimmer, but the first Tarzan to be in the ad for the watertight. So um, over the years, whether or not it was sponsoring the Frank Sinatra show, uh, um, you know, I just think that he, that. Artie especially was a, uh, a marketing genius and he really took over the company in 1935 when um, Joseph Bullock passed away. Yeah, what a great one too, you know, for, for Joseph to be the founder and do all the things he really did from a product standpoint that we had already discussed, but then for Artie to come in and really have that, that eye to marketing, you know, when, when many of these things were not, were not being done. I mean, this was groundbreaking um, communication initiatives. So um, it, it really set the foundation for the company to, uh, to live on for, for, for many, many years after, his, after both of them you know, were gone. So as if it wasn't enough, you know, Joseph Bulova and Artie, the brand leader has the, uh, the honor of having Omar Bradley, mm -hmm. General Omar Bradley as the chairman of the company. Tell us a little bit about General Bradley's contribution to yeah. the brand. So you said that a one-two punch. I think it's the one-two-three punch with Omar Bradley being third. And actually, on, uh, today I was listening to CNBC, and they happened to mention great generals, and they referred to Omar Bradley. Omar Bradley was a, the last five-star general of the United States. He was commissioned with that fifth star in uh, 1950 during the Korean conflict. And uh, he came... Uh, out of West Point in a very famous class of 1915, which included Dwight Eisenhower wow. and you know, rose through the ranks uh, uh, within the military. Um, in, 19, uh, in the World War II, under him served Harry D. Henschel, also known as the Colonel. So maybe that was the um, entree into Bulova. And at the end of the war, uh, Bulova started the Joseph Bulova School of Watchmaking, which was for disabled veterans coming back. But it not only gave them a vocation, but gave them dignity and a way for them to be able to care uh, for their families. It also was a way for Bulova to give back. Uh, so Omar Bradley came to the, I think, the opening of the uh, watchmaking school. At the time, he was the head of the Veterans Administration. And he also rose to become uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So he was really the guy uh, in the military. Um, after he retired, he was named chairman of the board of Bulova Research and Development. And Bulova was instrumental in a lot of uh, military intelligence. Uh, and a lot of people, this is sort of a very, very hidden story that people don't know about. Um, and it actually, some of it is hard to uncover because some of it was so top secret. But besides and we have you and we have you working on that as yeah. we speak, do we not? <laughs> um, but anyway, it's, it's been uh, very enlightening, but... Uh, as far as what they what they did, especially in the in the fifties and sixties post war, was this military military intelligence where they were involved in missile guidance systems and altimeters and ordnance devices, um, and actually the uh, both a building that was built uh, in Queens, the the, the giant uh, infrastructure there in nineteen fifty three, was built as a defense factory. Um, they were really into uh, defense and the expertise that they had because of uh, precision and timekeeping uh, and the tie with Omar Bradley spearheaded uh, that initiative. So they were not only known to consumers for the watches and clocks, but to the US government as a very key supplier in, in technology. Actually, one thing uh, we have for Omar Bradley in the museum is uh, he was 
reportedly to wear a watch that had five stars on the dial. Uh, he, he, he liked to wear an Accutron. And uh, Bova was able to manufacture and put uh, five stars, just a unique bespoke watch for him. And 12 times in his life, we're told that if somebody did something that impressed him or he wanted to pay back, he would take his watch off and give it to them as a thank you. And he always had the luxury of having another watch that could be made in the dial department. So in the museum, we actually have one of those 12 watches on loan to the museum uh, with the five star on it. So it, um, besides the Joseph Bulova, Artie Bulova, we have really a piece of memorabilia that ties us back to um, Omar Bradley. And uh, while I was at Bulova, um, I on occasion got to go into his office. He was, you know, long gone, but it was very powerful just to walk in that this was Omar Bradley's office and sit behind his desk. So cool. If we really look at uh, the company from the late fifties, you know, through I guess the early seven. When did Omar Bradley leave, Carl? Uh, Nineteen seventy-four. But he was there during the whole. Um, NASA development and Bulova participated in 46 different space missions. They produced uh, somewhere around 2000 items that uh, were part of the space program. And it wasn't just, you know, watches and clocks, they say it was timing devices and altimeters and, you know, different uh, parts that uh, uh, made the NASA program uh, successful. So I think that having that in and the connections with Omar Bradley, as well as the technology that Bulova could provide was a great marriage between corporate America and uh, the US government. Uh, I know that we know that we haven't done a really good job of really uncovering all that due to the, the fact that we, we have you on a project as we speak with Julie to really try to help us uncover all of the military and space. So I know that there'll be another episode uh, to this series, I'm sure, that we will cover just, you know, military and space. We, we yeah. could do probably hours. One thing I, I just uh, uncovered uh, was um, uh, bull of a mine detectors. Uh, you know, in the museum, we have a bull of a telescope that was used in tanks uh, during World War II. But anyway, it's in quite a fascinating story. Let's get to New York because uh, the brand has been in New York for all of its time, which, you know, not only being 145 years is unique, but also for a company and a brand to be based in one place for the entire time is pretty incredible. How did New York become such an important part of the company? Yeah, I think it's been a love story from day one. Uh, Joseph Bulova emigrated from what was then Bohemia, which is now part of the Czech Republic. Uh, to the US and it was sort of a land of opportunity. And, you know, and I think that it's been a hub, it's been a melting pot, not just of people, but of innovation and craftsmanship and fashion and technology and manufacturing and jewelry and marketing. So all of those elements, I think, um, helped create Bulova. I don't think that Bulova would have been successful uh, if it had started anywhere else. And so this giving back to New York and taking advantage of New York I think it's been part of that uh, DNA, and you know, you're sitting in the Empire State Building, which could be couldn't be any more iconic uh, for Boulevard's association with New York City. And on the New York thread, um, the New York World's Fair was in 1939. Uh, tell us about the role that Boulevard played uh, during the World's Fair. Yeah, well, that was actually that was not, not the only World's Fair in New York, but um, uh, in 1939, Boulevard participated and you would see Boulevard clocks everywhere. If you were to go into the World's Fair above the turnstiles, you would be going under the Boulevard clock. So either you would see it or you'd say, I'll meet you under the Boulevard clock. Boulevard was also at uh, LaGuardia Airport, uh, sort of the official clock there at Idlewild Airport, which um, uh, has been since renamed. And actually in 1964, the World's Fair, Boulevard mm -hmm. also was the main clock um, on the entrance. and um, at the World's Fair, they decided to do a time capsule. And this time capsule was going to be things that were very representative of that time period and to be open 5,000 years from 1964. Oh, wow. And so a Boulevard Accutron uh, was chosen to be part of that time capsule. So it's always been um, uh, part of the New, York, the New York landscape. That's so cool. I didn't know that last, uh, that last part about the time capsule. Well, we're going to have to wait 5,000 years. Right. I wonder who's, I wonder who's going to open it. I'll meet you there. <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, along with that, if, if there's any, ever any one comment that I get in the last many years that I've now worked for the company is, oh, you work over by the airport by JFK or LaGuardia. 
Tell, tell our viewers why there is a very big presence there, although we are not there any longer. Yeah. Um, and actually, when I started, that's, that's where I worked. Uh, in that, that, was your, that was your first place? That was first your place. place. Uh, and it's very iconic. It was built, uh, opened in 1953. Uh, the architect was not necessarily that famous at the time. Alexander Crosset um, was the architect. And it was built by Turner Construction, which had just completed the UN. Wow. Um, but it was built sort of as a horizontal factory, like a defense factory. And the design of the building was after the Federal Reserve Bank building in Washington, D.C. So if you ever see the Secretary of Treasure of the Treasury of the United States being interviewed or with a backdrop, you say, why is that person at Bolivar? But actually, it was the, uh, the model uh, from which the design came from. Uh, one little known fun fact about that building, yeah. uh, when it was sold in the 1980s, um, and it was a landmark, and they were allowed to use Boulevard Corporate Center as the name. Mm -hmm. uh, part of the terms and conditions of that sale was that they had to keep the clock running on time. Because the last thing Boulevard would want to have is the name Boulevard and a clock that was not perfectly on time. I have not paid attention to that. I'm going to have to, next time I drive by, I'm going to make sure that the clock is working. And Who if anybody out there ever finds that, let me know, because it's supposed to be running um, on schedule. So uh, I also know, just because I know a little bit about your career, you know, at the company from speaking to you now these, these many years, that you were involved in a lot of this, the sport licensing. Uh, but we also had... Uh, quite a presence in, especially in the New York area, in stadiums. I think people would be interested in knowing, you know, what different stadiums we were we were in. We had both clocks in, in quite a few of them, right? Yeah. Um, actually, the first, I guess, was Ebbets Field, which doesn't okay. exist anymore, uh, for the Brooklyn Dodgers. Um, and we have very many famous pictures. We have Jackie Robinson in front of the Boulevard uh, signage in, in there. In 1946, actually, somebody hit a home run and hit the Boulevard clock. Um, and uh, that whole episode was the inspiration for the, uh, the movie, The Natural, where the, so the guy hits the clock uh, or the, the, the lights in there. Um, but we were in uh, Shea Stadium at one time. Um, uh, many of the stadiums, I think we were in uh, Madison Square Garden uh, at one time. I was in charge of the sports time division and we did all sports teams at the time it was 130 professional sports team for major league baseball, basketball, football, and hockey. Uh, so I, you know, I got involved. We were actually still in Coors stadium out yeah. in, uh, in Denver, um, you know, on there. So uh, yeah, we were wherever people were, we seemed to be and uh, wanted to promote the, the Boulevard brand. Even, uh, even the Beatles tour, was it not? Uh, I remember seeing in, in the book yeah. behind you. Um, this very iconic piece, uh, we have a picture in the museum. The first Beatles concert, some people think it was at, at Shea Stadium, but no, it was at the uh, Washington Coliseum in February of 1964. And uh, you have this Coliseum with the Beatles uh, in the middle and a very famous picture. And above it is a Boulevard watch clock. So, um, as I say, you know, wherever, Boulevard, wherever the America was in pop culture, Boulevard was alongside of it. It's, it's really incredible. I mean, again, as someone who is now in the company, but ha never knowing all of these, you know, these firsts and this, this, fa this Boulevard being in the fabric of American culture is really quite, uh, it's quite amazing. It's quite a testament to all of the people like yourself, you know, previous executives who were in the company and managers and, and how they were able to, to really extend the brand, you know, through the, through the culture of, of the country. Um, uh, one, one other, uh, one other item like that is, um, we have it here in the museum is the bull of a subway token watch. Yeah. Uh, was that an actual token? What, yeah. how, how did that come to be? Yeah. As I say, we had this sort of love fest with New York. Um, I don't remember how I was there at the time. It was a uh, early nineties, 91. Um, and we decided let's uh, see if we can do an arrangement with New York city. So we did a contract. we got the tokens and that became the dial. Um, the carton was a, a tin, and on the outside was a map of the New York City subway. So it was sort of fun. It was sold in the Museum of New York at the time, as well as, as we sold it. But one thing that was nice is by doing the museum, I reached out to a lot of the retired Boulevard people, one of which was the sales and ex marketing executive who was in charge of that project that I worked with at the time. And um, 
he said, hey, how would you like to have a token watch? It is a mint condition, never been worn. And he donated it to the museum. Oh, so I thought that was very powerful that he felt that uh, he wanted that to be part of history. He was part of it. And that sort of continuum of the uh, Bull of a Legacy will, will continue. So um, uh, that, was, that was a fun project. I love that watch. I would love to redo it. I just don't think anybody today knows what a token is. Right. Well, well, <laughs> right. You could, you could do a, a Metro card, I guess. Huh? Yeah. Not as, not as sexy with everything that, you know, and I'm going to put you on the spot. What if, if you had to pick one thing, if you had to pick one item, I know it's hard. What are you most impressed about the bull of a company after all these years? What, what impressed you the most? One item. I actually, I probably would say the Accutron, the creation of the Accutron, 1960. Um, it was launched October 25th uh, at Basel in um, 1960. This was the first revolution in 300 years in timekeeping. It was things, something that people never did. Um, uh, it became iconic. Millions of these pieces were sold. Uh, so it, um, from a technical design standpoint, um, um, I just was uh, been extremely impressed um, and how prevalent it was, how aspirational it was. Actually, in the museum, one of the things I'd say, the item that excites people the most is an Accutron we have from 1960. It's solid gold. It's an asymmetric case, so it's a bit unusual. And it was owned by Elvis Presley. And so we acquired this a number of years ago, and it even has EP, the initials of Elvis Presley, on the case back. And he was not only an idol, but he was a watch collector. And he also wanted to have the latest and greatest uh, watch. So this became somewhat of a trophy on his wrist, where it was a statement. It was unusual from a fashion standpoint, but from a technology standpoint, it was you know equally a statement. So I, I think that the, the Accutron was... Um, really a leap ahead in, in watchmaking um, for generations. It's a great answer. And I think uh, because you and I are inside baseball, so to speak, I wanna take one step back out and just explain for the viewers, what's the relationship between Bulova and Accutron? Because uh, as we were just on our 60th anniversary last year and relaunched Accutron, a lot of people are not aware of this, you know, kind of, father-son or mother-daughter relationship between Bulova and Accutron? Yeah, Bulova is the sort of the, the mother brand. In the 1960s, it was launched as a new technology. Um, and over the years, it migrated from Bulova Accutron to standalone Accutron to Bulova Accutron again. Um, and what's really nice to see is in the relaunch of Accutron, it's going to be a standalone. It's going to have its own legs, but it does have that legacy. It has that history. Um, within the Bulova Corporation. So um, uh, it's, um, actually it's the watch I'm wearing right now is the new, um, the new technology, the let's electrostatic see. Let's movement. see, let's give us a quick look. Yeah, there it is, beautiful. Um, and actually we took pieces of the original Accutron, even the PMS color, there was the green. Um, and I, I will, maybe I'll digress, but I'll tell a little story about how the space view, and this is reminiscent of the space yes, view. That's a great uh, the, story. The space view was really a demo for salesmen to show retailers how the watch worked because it was sort of a new technology. How do you explain it? So they had it with an open dial and they show the jeweler how the tuning fork vibrated and uh, how, how it worked. And the, it was the retailers that what said- was the note? What was the note, Carl? What was the note that it would vibrate at? Um, it was- between an F and an F sharp. P yeah, it was people, a slightly flat F sharp, I think. I love that, um, yeah. And so it, it had this distinctive hum. But it was the jewelers who recommended, hey, I can now see how it works. Why don't you make it a model for consumers with that see-through? And it became what we called the space view and became iconic. And uh, that green color that you see on those old space views was never intended to be seen by consumers. It was supposed to be under the dial. So um, fast forward the 60 years as we're relaunching Accutron, we decided to embed that legacy of that green color uh, to tie back to the original origins of Accutron and put it into the new um, exposed dial of that electrostatic movement. Carl, thank you for that explanation. And I could literally talk to you as we have in the past for hours. 
Um, we don't have that much time for the program today, but I really appreciate all of the hard work and energy you've put in to help us rebuild the museum and to tell the story, the incredible story of, of the Bull of a Watch com a Corporation. Um, we look forward you know, to working uh, many years uh, ahead and continuing to tell the story. Any last parting words that you wanna share with us? Yeah, and actually one of the reasons I, I wear this because other people say, well, would you wear an old watch? And you know, I have had a, a lot of old watches, but um, the legacy is a continuum. And there are, there are new stories to be told and you know, it started in 1875 and it continues and continues. And it's nice to be part of um, this journey where we're looking back, but we're inspiring the future at the same time. Thank you, Carl. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.